Don't hold anything too tightly. Just wish for it, want it, let it come from the intention of real truth for you, and then let it go. For me, our soul is like it's unbound, it's limitless, but we will use words to limit ourselves. When people stop believing that somebody's got your back or Superman's coming, we turn to ourselves, and that's where you become empowered. Courageous participation attracts positive things. I'm Gwyneth Paltrow. This is the Goop Podcast, bringing together thought leaders, culture changers, creatives, founders and CEOs, scientists, doctors, healers and seekers, here to start conversations, because simply asking questions and listening has the power to change the way we see the world. Today is no exception. I'll let Elise fill you in on her extraordinary guest, and I'll come back after their conversation to answer a question from one of you. If you have a question you'd like me to get into in our next round of Ask Me Anything, send it to us at Goop on Instagram or Facebook. All right, over to Elise. Rick Doblin is the founder and executive director of the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. In other words, he's the guy that started MAPS, and I have wanted to interview him for a long time. Badly. Today, with Rick, we're talking about the regulation of medical uses of psychedelics and therapy. This topic is seriously fascinating to me. I talked to Rick about how MDMA therapy works and how it can potentially help people to view painful and fear-based memories in a more self-reflective way, which in turn can help people work through trauma. But Rick will explain that much better than I can in our conversation. Our goal is to help people have these psychedelic experiences as few times as possible so that then they can integrate the experiences without drugs and learn other ways to modulate traumatic experiences or thoughts. Let's get into it now. Thanks for having me at your house. Oh, Lisa, it's a pleasure to have you here. You seem to be an expert in connection, right? What do most people want? Is it that they themselves want the the spiritual experience or healing, or they just want to donate for other people to have those experiences? Well, lately we've been joking that everybody wants to be a psychedelic therapist. Yeah, me too. (laughs) Sign me up. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, everybody. I think that most people, of course, want their own healing and their own sense of connection. And then it's incredibly satisfying to sit for other people and see them grow and see them move, move out of constrained spaces. And so it's very satisfying. And so I think a lot of people want to do that. But then there's others that say they want to run a psychedelic clinic, but they don't want to be the therapist. Some people Mm -hmm. say it's too painful for me to be with people that are suffering, to hear their stories. Mm. And what I've been experiencing is that there's a a delicate balance. You, You have to be there with them with their pain and suffering. But if your attention can be more on the growth that's happening rather than the pain that they're growing from, then you can be positive about it and it can be energizing rather than debilitating Mm -hmm. and and so i I figure a friend of ours is um, an oncologist and i figured it must be like that if you're always dealing with people that are dying and they have cancer you know and if you just focus on this cancer relentless cancer um, it's going to be very depressing but if you're actually helping some people get better and helping them live you can focus not so much on the crisis but on the response Mm -hmm. And isn't it too that within sort of the psychedelic healing and transformation that one of the aha moments is that people stop seeing the experience as negative or positive, but as this thing that happened or this thing that is? Yeah. And it's a thing that defined them in right. a way that they've learned from it. And so it's not that they wish that it didn't happen. I mean, like, you know, people that were in the Holocaust or how, you you know, you wish that it didn't happen, Mm -hmm. but that you accept the fact that it did happen and it is part of your story. But it's a situation, you can describe it about the shift between the foreground and the background. When you've got trauma, the trauma is in the foreground and it seems like it's always about to happen. It's defining you. It's, it's bigger than you. This is what happened and it's taken over your life. Mm-hmm. And the thing with the therapy is to process it, to metabolize the fear, to metabolize the trauma so that it moves into the background. Right. And you're not constantly re-traumatized or triggered, and but it never goes away. So mm-hmm. I think that's the other big part is people think, this therapy is going to make it so that that's never going to be painful whenever I think about it. And it's not that it's more that 
you can place it in the past. Right. Whereas with PTSD, it's like it's always about happening still. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it seems like it's also about allowing the things that your subconscious won't let you, that it's protecting you from, it allows them to come up so you can even know what it is that you're working with. Very much. And so we, we've just been talking to some of the people in our studies and the idea is that if things are unconscious, you might think that they're not bothering you, but they're influencing everything you do, and they're below your level of awareness. And so when they come to the surface, these painful memories, if you can see that as part of a healing process, then it makes it easier to handle. Mm-hmm. Because then, and what people often say is, I'm scared of losing control. Mm-hmm. And what we tell them is that you're out of control already. That right. as long as it's unconscious and influencing you, it's completely out of your control. It totally. just colors everything. But if you bring it to the surface, you will actually lose conscious control in a certain way, be deeper in touch with these emotions, but it's about getting more in control. So you have mm-hmm. to lose control to gain control. Yeah, it almost seems like it must be like the the discovery of shrapnel right and like getting it out it still might leave a scar you know it still was present in your body but it's no longer like under there yeah causing pain yeah and i I think what we've also found is that it's harder to forgive yourself than it is to forgive others Mm -hmm. and so a lot of times people have been traumatized and stuff's been done to them and they have to work through that but what we also see is that sometimes people who have been traumatized then become uh, perpetrators themselves and traumatize right. others. So you hear that about a lot of childhood sexual abuse, that it's people who were abused themselves and then they don't know anything different in a way, and that's how they mm-hmm. abuse their own children. Right. So that the, the, these sort of traumas that go down from generation to generation are passed in that way. But if you can both surface the trauma that was initially done to you and process that, then you still have to process, which is even harder, the traumas that you've inflicted on others. Right. And so that's where we think that a lot of the the really deep work has to be done. And that's where you need therapists who are not judgmental, who mm-hmm. are compassionate and sympathetic, who, who realize that none of us are perfect. We all have our weaknesses and our moments of, of not living up to our ideal selves and that it's the struggle to be better that we can identify with rather than judging people for the things that they did wrong. Right. And I think too, sometimes even the acknowledgement or having someone who can say, yes, that was traumatic. So I think that in this culture, yeah. trauma is often defined as things that are very extreme, right? Like wartime and <laughs> childhood sexual abuse. and But there's clearly a spectrum. And a friend of mine was saying, he was talking to someone who's very experienced in this field, and he was explaining his his childhood. And this therapist said to him, "So, as a child, how did you feel? Like, how did you feel with your parents?" And he was like, "Well, my father was very, you know, I had a, very, a great upper middle class upbringing. Mm-hmm. My dad was very scary." And he was like, "So, what did you do with that? Who did you go to? Did you go to your mom?" Mm-hmm. And he was like, "No, I didn't go to anyone." Mm-hmm. And then he was like, "Well, think about your own." you know, children, how would you, how would you, what would you want them to do if they were scared? Mm -hmm. And he was like, I'd want them to tell me or my wife. And and somehow that was enough of a connection for him to identify with his child, what he must have himself felt. Like he'd had no sympathy for himself, if that makes sense, or no acknowledgement of how that might have been traumatic until it was put into the context of how would you feel if that were your own child? And just that people are... um have a difficult time being compassionate for themselves and that there's a way in which, particularly when you've been the perpetrator, mm-hmm. um, that's the hardest right. of all. And that's a, a big component of psych, some psychedelics, right? That it through, uh, that there is a life review where you experience how you've impacted everyone around you. Yeah. So if we think about all these, you know, traumas, whether they're like, dramatic traumas or just you felt nobody was listening to you when you were a child, whatever, that there's all these things that are sort of below the level of awareness that are very um, emotionally connected and that influence that. When you take a psychedelic, you could say that there's a barrier between the conscious and the unconscious, and that barrier is weakened or made more permeable under psychedelics. So Mm -hmm. Stan Groff says that, uh, Stan Groff meaning the world's 
more ex- most experienced LSD researcher, says that that LSD is a non-specific amplifier of the unconscious. Mm-hmm. So in our therapeutic approach, we don't know what's most charged for people, and what comes up. There's kind of a basic assumption that we make about this uh, inner healing intelligence or the inner healer Mm -hmm. that we all know that our body knows how to heal itself and that's beyond our conscious ability somehow the body just tries to repair itself Mm -hmm. and so we think that there's something very similar with the psyche and that the order of which things come to the surface during a psychedelic therapeutic experience goes beyond our conscious understanding but we just trust that there's some sort of a wisdom to it and so we help people experience and express that, whatever it is. The, the essence of our therapeutic approach is what we call inner directed. Mm-hmm. So that people are their own guides. We don't use the word guide. Mm-hmm. We don't know where people need to go. And so, for example, I was working, there was one person that from the military that had several of his friends that were killed. Mm-hmm. And we thought that that's what would be the focus of the therapy sessions. But as it turned out, it went to an earlier time in childhood when he felt that his father had beaten him. Mm. And so the, the connection was from seeing his friends who had been murdered by an infiltrator when they were helpless in their sleeping bags. Mm. But it went to his earlier feelings of helplessness being mm-hmm. beaten by his father. So none of us would have been able to predict that, Mm -hmm. but it was something about the energy that was attached to those kind of feelings that that's what emerged for him. So before he could even process what was going on with the actual friends of his that were murdered, it was about this feeling of hopelessness and helplessness, Mm -hmm. you know, with him and his father. So there's this inner healer that brings these energy charges to the surface connected to different episodic memories and so basically there's episodic memory and emotional memory and they're linked together but they're stored in different parts of the brain Mm. and so what we're trying to do is help people actually have a better memory for what happened for the trauma so we find under mdma therapy that people's memories is are enhanced for the trauma but they're able to look at it as something that has happened in the past that's part of their story but that's not the dominant Mm-hmm. element of their story and that it's not happening now it happened in the past and that sense of peacefulness and it's in the past then gets when the memory is what's called reconsolidated in your brain you sort of swapped out the fear-based memory connected to that incident to mm-hmm. this more reflective it's in the past it's part of my story so then the next time you remember it you remember the episode but with the new emotion attached to it that mm-hmm. it's in the past and not happening and so it's not like the memory of the trauma goes away, but it's not linked to such pain as it right. was before. So I know that you have tried everything. <laughs> no, I haven't. But uh, you've done LSD, I know, famously. Yeah, yeah, that was the, your entree. Yeah, yeah. Ibogaine, ayahuasca. Yeah, yeah. mescaline. What? Mescaline. Mushrooms. Yeah. Fair, I, I can tell you firsthand that you smoke a lot of pot. <laughs> yeah. I think that it's important <laughs> to oscillate between being straight and being high. Okay. There, there was this point in my life when I was like 24 years old. It was kind of a sad day. I even remember it today. I was realizing I can't accomplish what I want to accomplish in my life if I'm wake and bake and stoned all the time. <laughs> and I was like, damn, I think that's true. I'm going to have to cut down on my pot smoking. But you have accomplished a lot. Well, it's actually 47 years 47 since years. I was 18 years old and decided to devote my life to psychedelics, becoming a psychedelic therapist, going through my own psychedelic therapy and trying to bring it back so I could be a legal psychedelic therapist. What are the primary hurdles mm-hmm. for, for that need to be cleared for this to become more mainstream and have application beyond severe PTSD? Well, the the main hurdle is that we have been um, from 1986 when I started MAPS to 2016 is when we took us 30 years to get to the point of what's called an end of phase two meeting with FDA. Mm. And so that all those 30 years were getting permission, getting funding, training therapists, treating and trying to figure out how to design phase three, because phase three is the large scale multi-site studies that you need to conduct 
to prove safety and efficacy to get approval for prescription use. Mm-hmm. So as of a few days ago, we've got 25 out of 200 people in our phase three studies. And we, we may need to treat a few more than 200. We're not sure yet. We'll know that early next year. So the, the main hurdle is really to continue to enroll patients and treat them. And from the FDA's point of view, it's basically, it's a three and a half month process mm-hmm. where there's people only get MDMA three times, one month apart, and they get 12 90 minute non-drug psychotherapy sessions, mm-hmm. three before the first MDMA for preparation and three after each MDMA for integration. And we're comparing those people that get therapy with inactive placebo versus those people who get therapy with active MDMA. And two months after the last experimental session is what's called the primary outcome measure. Mm -hmm. So we have to complete that for 200 people. But then the other big question is going to be how do we get insurance coverage for it? Mm -hmm. And so we also do a one-year follow-up which is more for healthcare utilization and to show that it's durable or to see if it's durable. Fortunately, in phase two, what we've shown is people keep getting better from the two month to the 12 month follow up. They're, they're motivated to try other things. They know that when these fears come up, that they can process them. They don't have to shut them down. They Mm -hmm. can experience them and learn from them. So people are developing the skills to keep getting better on their own. So what we have to do is complete the phase three ideally in Europe as well, and then really do the arguments with the insurance companies about healthcare utilization. And then the big prize, if we can manage to do it, is to persuade the Veterans Administration and the Department of Defense Mm -hmm. to get more involved in MDMA research. And as of September of 2018, there was 1,036,000 veterans receiving disability payments for PTSD. Wow. And another hundreds and hundreds, probably half a million that are receiving disability for anxiety, depression, and other mental health disorders. And the cost in human suffering is enormous, and the cost in money is enormous. Because a lot of these are young people. Most of them are young people. So if they're on disability now, they might be on disability for the next 50 years or 40 years. So it's just enormous. And so what we're hoping is that one day the Veterans Administration will be willing to either do MDMA therapy inside the VA or refer people to outside clinics and then pay for it. Mm -hmm. And we've started trying to work inside the VA in 1990. So we're 29 years, and I think that there's a good chance that this year or early next year we'll finally succeed. When I look back on it, because I really woke up about the value of LSD in 1971 and 72, and so during the 60s and I was in high school, I believed what I was told. I didn't know that I was being told massive propaganda, but I thought you take LSD five or six times and you're certifiably insane, mm-hmm. that it's sort of knocked you off balance and each one knocks you off balance more and then by you know, five or six times you're done for. Right. And I believed a lot of those things and a lot of society did too. So when, when I think about how, why I think we're gonna succeed now in mainstreaming psychedelics, it's not just that uh, Goop is talking about it, <laughs> but it's, that's a big part Doing of it. Our part. <laughs> But it's also that you look at the way society has evolved, and you might think under Trump that we've devolved, Mm -hmm. but Gary Kasparov, who was the world chess champion, Mm -hmm. who was, uh, I've been involved with the Human Rights Foundation, and he was the um, president or the board of directors of the Human Rights Foundation. He's an anti-Putin activist, but he talked about the way in which we're being manipulated, people are being manipulated on their fears and anxieties and their hatreds of the others, that that's a fever, not a virus, meaning that it's not going to do us in. It's sort of bringing this short-sighted kind of thinking to the surface so that we can see it, Mm -hmm. and then hopefully enough of us can decide that's not the way we want to be. But I would say that when the psychedelics really emerged in the 60s, I remember um, the Beatles sort of getting into meditation and the Maharishi would come in these white robes and everybody thought that was super weird. And that was when um, yoga, people were worried that if you did yoga, that you were going to become converted to another religion. Right. And so now you go to every YMCA and there's yoga and, you know, now there's meditation and you don't have to be wearing these weird robes and, you know, be somebody who wants to meditate in a cave on a mountaintop. 
So I think as a society, we've integrated yoga and meditation and mindfulness. I just spoke at Wisdom 2.0, which is a conference on technology and mindfulness, but mm -hmm. they've now felt comfortable enough that they could weave back in psychedelics. Mm -hmm. So mindfulness is that. In the 60s, women were tranquilized when they gave birth and men were not allowed in the delivery room. So that's completely turned around. Yeah. My aunt died of cancer when she was 21. Mm. And my grandparents didn't even tell her she had cancer. You didn't even talk about it. It was a wow. horrible thing. I was only four years old at the time. The family story is I said, well, you know, is God going to give her her medicine? Oh. But now we have hospice centers. So the first hospice center was 1974. Mm -hmm. And now there's 6,000 hospice centers in America. So we've re evaluated our approach to death and birth, mm -hmm. to spirituality and meditation and yoga. And if you look at advertising and you look at movies and look at psychedelic imagery that's throughout all these movies and just the, the art and the creativity of psychedelics has also become more mainstreamed. Mm -hmm. We basically integrated everything that emerged during the 60s except for the psychedelics themselves. And the other big thing that we've done is that psychedelics, when they came out in the 60s, were so connected to the counterculture, to people who were protesting, to the youth who were against the Vietnam War. And you know, I myself was a draft resistor for Vietnam. But people have seen over the last 50 years that large, most of the people that did psychedelics went on to have normal lives and mm -hmm. didn't go live on communes and didn't decide to become a soybean grower and ended up making really positive contributions in their lives, with Steve Jobs being among one of the main examples. Yeah. And so it's pretty clear that the psychedelics, even though they seemed like they were connected to counterculture, revolutionary concepts and ideas, that that was a construct of the time, right. and that that's not a construct of the drugs. That's, that's sort of the relationship that we had with the drugs at the time, and now we can make different relationships. Mm -hmm. And I would say that the problem that, that we're having with this globalization and people becoming more exposed to other cultures and other religions and this mass migration and the internet of, of just the way in which we're all in contact with people that are different from us way more than ever before. And for many people, that's turning into an issue and you know we see what's happening with uh, immigrants even though we're a, you know a nation of immigrants and now we're mm -hmm. turning against immigrants it's but i think what's clear to many many people is that this sense of spirituality the sense of connection also to nature i mean we've got you know the current republican policies are um, denying climate change and you know let's get rid of automobile mileage standards and pollution All sorts and of regulations yeah yeah that that that's that the the antidote for that is that spiritual sense of connection we're connected to other people we're connected to the planet and that that's our primary heritage from you know billions of years of evolution it does seem like the sense of spiritual connection there's a hunger for that and i love that it's been now it's been vets who have been leading the charge you know and yeah i mean the statistics are incredible right well i think first off i just want to say that there's according to the national center for ptsd which is part of the veterans administration they mm -hmm. said there's eight million americans right now with ptsd yeah so the vast majority that seems understated i think it is yeah i think it is but the vast majority of them are not veterans right there are people women with sexual abuse or men with sexual abuse with abusive parents without sexual abuse but just violent unloving surroundings or, or living in certain neighborhoods or, mm -hmm. or um, poverty or if you're so i feel like i've myself am um, blessed in so many ways i had a very loving family but I was traumatized indirectly by the stories I was told growing up about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And then I was traumatized as a young boy in school during the Cuban Missile Crisis and the arms race, and we're told just duck under your desk in case there's going to be a bomb. And, I know. Uh, and it's like you, you think that's reassuring, but to a little kid, you're like, yeah. this desk is going to save me if you see these pictures of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and like, how's this desk going to save me? just thinking about what's happening to nature and what's happening to species, we're all traumatized yeah. or we're dead to it. You know, we're, we're desensitized, but if we're at all alert, everybody is experiencing great trauma. And now mm -hmm. we see that there's more suicides and depression among young people than there's ever been and before. And they have like active shooter drills and yeah. imminent 
environmental decline and yeah it's yeah my daughter herself was saying you know she doesn't know that she'll live past 50 and mm. i'm like well you're only 20 but you know that's not that far away but it, the way in which it short circuits your ability to even plan for your life yeah so there's so much stress that and the old ways have not worked that there's an openness for all sorts of different things mm -hmm. and so i think that's makes us we need to be even more careful not to overstate so i'd say mm -hmm. the one big mistake that we could make we mean the psychedelic uh, therapy community or the psychedelic uh, spirituality community is to overstate the the benefits or the possibilities or or to put all of it into the drugs it's not the drugs it's the relationship with the drugs mm -hmm. it's mdma assisted psychotherapy with the emphasis on psychotherapy yep. not the drug we've talked to loads of people who've taken these drugs at raves or festivals and stuff and been with a bunch of friends and MDMA does bring things up to the surface that can be painful but then when they think their friends just want to have a good time and they don't want to hear about these painful stories they try to stuff their feelings down yeah. they end up worse off for months or years afterwards right so we just have to be careful not to overstate it it's not going to work for everybody mm -hmm. but these drugs are remarkable and they've been used for thousands of years i mean we have new ones that have recently been invented but they're similar in this uh, way of bringing things from the unconscious to the conscious so that i think uh, the need is so great that we just have to be measured and balanced about how we present the possibilities right no they're a tool right in yeah. the toolkit along yeah. with yeah holotropic breath work and somatic therapy and but i think it's interesting yeah. to think about the other what they bring up and then how the trauma can be expressed and then what that also suggests in the way of therapy. And I think the fact that you, you talked about the holotropic breath work. So Stan Groff was so brilliant in the sense that when LSD was criminalized, he found a way using uh, hyperventilation, which is basically holotropic breath work says just breathe faster and deeper. Mm -hmm. Nothing more complicated than that, but in a context where you're understanding you're trying to bring things to the surface mm -hmm. and so the beauty of that is to realize that even with drugs what's coming up is not drug experiences it's human experiences that the drugs make us accessible to but you can get to that through meditation through breath work through yoga through any number of different ways flotation tanks or yeah. making love <laughs> or all different ways and that they're properties of humanity and that we we need to really learn all the different ways and one of the most important things I'd say from the world of psychedelics and why we're talking about nonprofit drug development is that our goal is to help people have these psychedelic experiences as few times as possible mm -hmm. so that then they can integrate the experiences without drugs and learn other ways to modulate traumatic experiences or thoughts so that our goal is to make people their baseline to improve their baseline without right. drugs and we think that psychedelics encased in a therapeutic process only need to be used a few times yeah because it's not in my from my understanding and you're obviously far more expert <laughs> but that it's not it's work it's not this process yeah. like the eight hour mdma yeah. session with two therapists like it's like childbirth a little bit, yeah. but it's not a recreational fun time. Uh, well, a bunch of the people have said, uh, I don't know why they call this ecstasy. Right. <laughs> yeah, a bunch of our patients have said that. And I think your, your analogy to childbirth is exactly right because the therapists are like the midwives. Mm -hmm. And so we're, but the people have to do the work themselves. People heal themselves. We just try to provide a safe support. We know the process in general. We know where they could be getting stuck. We know certain ways to help them reorient themselves when they're stuck mm -hmm. but really we're not doing the work we shouldn't be taking the credit and so what we have learned that's different from the research with lsd or psilocybin both from the 50s and 60s and currently is that in that research with addiction with people scared of dying with depression it seems that there's a relationship between the mystical experience going beyond ego states the mm -hmm. sense of unity and connection between the depth of those experiences and therapeutic outcomes the more people have this kind of unit of mystical experience the better they seem to do mm -hmm. however we do not find that with mdma for ptsd it, it seems that the mystical experience which people do have under mdma and in fact my I would say my most mystical experience of my life was under MDMA, mm. not LSD or all these other drugs that I've taken, but that 
you need to really be grounded in your ego in your biography and what happened in the memory of your trauma but feeling safe in order to get better from it and it's mm -hmm. not about this ego dissolution mystical experience just a second we're taking a quick break I have a new skincare obsession. This one is a weekly thing and it is called Goop Glow Glycolic Acid Overnight Peel, <laughs> which I definitely cannot say 10 times fast, but if you're remotely as into exfoliating as I am, I think you are going to be curious about this. Our overnight peel was inspired by a chemical peel that I used to get from my dermatologist. It would totally transform my skin. My team at Goop developed this new peel pad with a whopping 15% glycolic acid for intense exfoliating. And we ran clinical tests on these too to prove that it works. One side of the pad is really soft, so I use it on my face and wait for the tingling feeling to come. The other side of the pad is more like a gauze texture, which I like for my neck, chest, and shoulders. After I use the Goop Glow Glycolic Peel, I do my usual routine of goop, night cream, and go to bed. And when I wake up in the morning, I can completely see the difference. Fresher, softer, smoother, glowy skin. It is extremely satisfying. If you want to try Goop Glow Glycolic Peel, and I know you do, head to goop.com slash glowpeel15 podcast. And when you order a box of the Glow Peel, we'll give you 15% off. Just enter promo code GLOWPEEL15. We started this podcast last March because we wanted a new way to share ideas, tips, and knowledge from experts and leaders across diverse fields and backgrounds and ways of thinking. The content team at Goop spends their day asking questions. We want to figure out who is doing the most cutting-edge research on the gut, where is the best place to stay in San Sebastian, and straight from the office water cooler the other week, what kind of protein bars do people like? Someone on the team turned me on to Think High Protein Bars. They're made with 20 grams of protein, zero grams of sugar, and no artificial flavors or GMOs. Think has a bunch of different flavor options, but I'll give you some highlights. Their brownie crunch bar tastes like the rich chocolate brownie you'd want, and the creamy peanut butter bar tastes like a scoop of creamy peanut butter sandwiched in chocolate. But it's one of those things you have to try for yourself Think's motto is, I think I can. They believe that with the right energy and nutrition, we can do pretty much anything we put our minds to, which is a pretty good mindset to try out. And to test out Think's high-protein bars, for starters, go to thinkproducts.com. Enter code GOOP25, and you'll get 25% off your order. That's thinkproducts.com, and use code GOOP25 for 25% off. This one expires on October 21st, 2019. And now, back to today's conversation. Let's talk about the mystical experiences, mm. though. Oh. I mean, how can I not? <laughs> what, what do you think that that is? Like, what's your... Well, well, yeah. Yeah, like, what's your theory of the universe? Okay, well... <laughs> I'm not so big on philosophy. I'm more of a practical kind of guy. And, and you could get lost in religion and all these theories. But I'll, I'll say that Aldous Huxley, who wrote the book Doors of Perception, mm -hmm. after his mescaline experience, which really helped broaden the whole interest in psychedelics, that was still in the 50s. But his theory, I think, has now been proven right by the latest neuroscience, which is that the brain is a reducing valve. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about all of the exquisite sensory information that's coming into us, it's way more than we can process at any one time in a conscious way. But our our brain and, and what the modern neuroscientists are finding, it's called the default mode network. So the part of our brain that's essential to our sense of self, our sense of ego. And earlier before we started recording, we were talking about Abraham Maslow and the need the, the hierarchy of needs. And so I think that what we're, what's happening is that our, our brain, our sense of self, is filtering perceptions according to our hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. You know, if we think we're, you know, starving, you know, it'll be more focused on food, or if we need shelter, it'll be on that, or, or you know, we need social needs, social affirmations, and 
all different kind of purpose in life, meaning in life, self-actualization. We have all these different needs. So I think what's happening is that this uh, brain is sort of filtering what we focus on based on our sense of self and that the psychedelics weaken that filtering system. And so we have a flow of information that is always there, but that we're usually not paying attention to. Mm -hmm. And it weakens that sort of point of reference from our ego. And then we just see how much we're part of this big, enormous community of humanity, of, of animals, of life on earth, of you know this evolutionary process. And that that's spiritual is to realize that you know, we're stardust. I mean, that's kind of a, mm-hmm. a song, you know, but it's at the same time, it's true. When you think about where a lot of these elements come from in our body. And so you realize you're, you're, you're not this, you, we are both bounded in time and space and in birth and death, but we're also part of something much, much larger. Right. And I think that most of the time we're just focused on this bounded in time and space between life and death and what's the meaning. And there's nothing before and nothing after. Yeah. But I think under psychedelics, you realize that we're just part of this enormous, glorious adventure. Hard to say what the purpose of it is, <laughs> but the purpose is to love and to you know to to appreciate every moment and to be kind. And I think that that's my theory of the universe. And it doesn't so much matter, you know, who you know how did it start or how does it right. end, but but what do we do now and and how do we contribute to making the world a little bit kinder, a little bit nicer, and to having people laugh and smile and have a better time of it. <laughs> <laughs> so what, I know obviously you're focused on MDMA and PTSD mm. right now, tactically, is that your favorite psychedelic? Yeah. If you had all the money in the world to support your research ah. and FDA <laughs> support, what would you go after? Well, I would go after Ibogaine next. Mm-hmm. But, but let me describe the theory, I guess. Uh, and the reason I go for Ibogaine, and then I'll, I'll say this other point, is that you look at all these people that are struggling with opiate addiction. Mm -hmm. Ibogaine is, I think, remarkably effective for opiate addiction, for helping people go through the withdrawal, but also having them have psychological experiences about things that they've not wanted to see, what they've suppressed. Mm -hmm. So that comes to the surface. They can see more how they're hurting themselves and others, but they can also have a spiritual sense of connection. So I think of all the people that are Trump supporters, there's some sociologists that have done some studies about what are called despair deaths, so despair deaths are deaths from alcoholism, suicide, and drug addiction. And the counties that have more despair deaths, more vote for Trump. Mm. That's not the only reason people vote for Trump, but you know that's one of the dominant things. So I think how do we address the pain and the suffering that the Trump supporters are feeling? Mm-hmm. What, what can we offer to them that's more of a real benefit than this pseudo benefit of displace your fears and anxieties on these other people and go after them and they're the cause of your problems. Mm. And I think that the psychedelics can help people cope with addictions. And I think Ibogaine can help particularly with opiate addiction. And it can also help spiritualize all sorts of people that are otherwise um, hopeless and unclear and you know what we see with medical marijuana actually is that and marijuana legalization is that those people that the the most important predictor of whether somebody is in favor of legalizing marijuana is if they know a medical marijuana patient mm. so then they get their own direct information that they believe so i think that if we can help a bunch of people with ibogaine overcome their opiate addictions and they feel a little bit more spiritual and connected they will change other minds but what I wanted to say before is that the strategy, and I love that idea of if I had all the money in the world, but I'll, I'll just say that I had a ketamine experience. I had a DMT experience one day where I was feeling the spiritual sense of connection. And, and at one point I had this idea that in the deepest recesses of our minds where we think it's super private, mm-hmm. you know, where we're thinking and nobody can hear our thoughts, but we're thinking, I realized that I was thinking with words Mm -hmm. and I didn't invent those words. Other people invented those words. So in my head was thousands of years of of language development and of all of this so that even in my innermost private spot that it wasn't really private. It was part of this whole collective that it permitted me to reach these thoughts. 
And then it was just this beautiful thing about the sweep of history and how glorious that was. And I'm part of this, you know, massive evolutionary process. And, but then I realized that I couldn't just claim to be part of everything that was good. If I'm part of everything and everything is part of me, then Hitler is inside me too. Mm -hmm. So when I realized that logically, and I didn't sort of turn away from it, it was like I sunk like a stone and it was a horrible realization that I've got this inner Hitler that Mm -hmm. I want to control and I I have aspects of me that are like that. And that took me about a day to just even just deal with that idea. It was really difficult. And the next day we did ketamine. This was um, a group of us (laughs) at Esalen preparing to defend MDMA. This is back in 1985. (laughs) So the ketamine experience, I'm hovering above and behind Hitler as he's giving a speech. And I've always been, you know, traumatized by the Holocaust, terrified by Hitler. And so, but the ketamine gave me this feeling that I was um, safe. I wasn't quite there. I was sort of above and behind him. And I got this whole sense as he's giving the speech to, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. I started thinking, how do we get inside his head? How do I get inside his head so that he doesn't want to kill all these people? How, How do we undo that kind of Madness, and then I saw that the the Heil Hitler salute in a whole different way than I'd ever seen it. So I so he, so when he does this Heil Hitler, and then everybody does it back to him, I felt like it was this ping pong almost, like this ball of energy that he was pushing it out to them, and then they were the crowd was sort of pushing it back to him, and then they would repeat it back and forth, and it was like this ball that was getting more intense with all, and it was like this the many giving the power to the one Mm -hmm. and sort of back and forth and back and forth and how they could all be kind of involved in this group kind of thinking and that they could all feel. And and then I felt like if I panic, I felt the fear rise in me. And I I felt if I panic, I'm never going to be able to undo this or think about this. And and then I realized with ketamine that I could just breathe and that if I could breathe, I wouldn't be so terrified. And so I felt like I didn't panic. But then I, I kind of recognized that there was no way to change his mind, mm-hmm. that he was getting so much out of it. Hitler was getting so much out of it. that, And the fundamental thing is that you have to be willing to change. You know, you can't just give somebody a psychedelic and they're going to have a spiritual experience. They have to be willing to go into space. So I actually realized that, ironically, you could say that it's easier to change the minds of 100,000 people that are giving away their power to a dictator than to change the mind of the one person Mm. because they're getting so much out of it and they don't necessarily want to change. Right. So what that means to me is mass mental health. That's the long-term goal. And that has to go beyond medicine. So the medicine route, the nonprofit pharmaceutical company is a strategy that makes sense in and of itself to bring these drugs to the surface for treating people that are suffering for whom other things haven't worked so well. Mm -hmm. But that's only part of it. And then there's another part, like religious freedom. But, you know, we have the Native American church that can use peyote, and some of the ayahuasca churches are legal in the U.S. But again, you're stuck in this religious framework. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to move beyond religion, move beyond medicine to fundamental human rights to change your consciousness. And so the strategy that you asked me about, if I had all the money in the world, is to medicalize a series of psychedelics and then roll out thousands and thousands and thousands of psychedelic clinics. Mm -hmm. And then once there's enough of those, then we start really developing mass mental health in this spiritual way. And I think that's really going to be a necessary prerequisite to getting over where humanity is right now. Totally. And I think that the people who are most traumatized and addicted are the ones who are the, currently the most disenfranchised. Yeah. And so go, starting there and sort of bringing them into the fold feels essential in this country. Yeah. And, and also what we see is, I mean, even the fact of this podcast is that scientific studies are um, covered by the media. Mm-hmm. You know, so if, if if I had just been doing, you know, psychedelics, we wouldn't be talking. But it was psychedelic research mm-hmm. that granted a certain kind of legitimacy. But what I'm saying goes beyond psychedelic research mm-hmm. in a way. So I think this focus on healing the worst off, and particularly that's why we work with severe chronic PTSD, because there's a lot of people that are stuck in that, that, mm-hmm. that they don't have tools that are that whatever they've tried hasn't worked for them and Mm -hmm. so there needs new tools but i think it's this 
way in which we do science, it gets spread through the media and we get earned media that we can never pay for, but it's helping overcome billions and billions of dollars of paid ads about how drugs are bad. Mm -hmm. And drugs are just a scapegoat for problems the way immigrants are a scapegoat Mm -hmm. and other things. So I think there's a real possibility that we have through the medical research to demonstrate that it's it's about the relationship that we have with these drugs yeah that will be what we really need to bring forth in society and then we can change our relationships and then we can start moving towards more harm reduction rather than uh, criminalization and then yeah. eventually mass mental health so take us through just the brass hacks let's, let's say okay. i've again yeah. so what would need to happen we have uh, demonstrated the route through MDMA assisted psychotherapy. Now, again, we're a couple years away. We we haven't succeeded yet. But for Ibogaine to become a medicine, Ibogaine has certain risks. Mm -hmm. And people have died from heart problems related to it. Mm -hmm. However, in a medicalized setting, when people take Ibogaine and they're monitored, nobody needs to die and nobody needs to have any permanent damage. Right. And it's also a very effect, like probably health impaired, health impacted population, right? If you're talking about IV... Yeah. And people who are shooting up heroin. Yeah, yeah. They're already, you know, health compromised. Yeah. Right. So the first thing that needs to happen is a medical grade version of Ibogaine, mm-hmm. what's called GMP, good manufacturing practices that would be accepted by FDA. Then there needs to be what's called a phase one slash two dose response safety study that'll cost two, two and a half million dollars that would take either opiate addicts or traumatic brain injury people and maybe 30 or 40 of them. And an initial ones get several different doses, one placebo and one low dose and one slightly higher dose. So we need to demonstrate safety basically to the satisfaction of the FDA. So first off, you get the drug. Then you get these safety studies in humans. Then you need to answer other questions about neurotoxicity, about other questions about the the effect of the drug on the body. And then you have to start doing these phase two studies. So MDMA is the most gentle of all the psychedelics. Mm -hmm. And it's the easiest to integrate because it doesn't uh, dissolve the ego. This default mode network is not weakened. Mm -hmm. It also, we believe that therapists and psychiatrists that are going to administer it to patients will be more effective if they've tried the drug themselves. Mm -hmm. And so there's more resistance among psychiatrists and psychotherapists to take LSD or psilocybin or ayahuasca. Or Ibogaine. Or Ibogaine. Oh, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Then there is MDMA. Yeah. So then we needed a patient population that was highly sympathetic to the larger culture. Mm -hmm. And something that people recognized as an illness that didn't have a lot of good treatments available as well. So that's became PTSD. Mm -hmm. And it is a little sad for me that it's all focused on veterans, but that has because so many more people have PTSD that are not veterans. But at the same time, there's a lot of veterans that have PTSD. And and you're getting there, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we're getting one of the good things that we learned in our phase two studies is that MDMA assisted psychotherapy for PTSD works regardless of the cause of PTSD. Mm. So the SSRIs, Zoloft and Paxil, that are only drugs approved for PTSD, worked better in women than in men and didn't work in combat-related PTSD. Mm. But MDMA-assisted therapy seems to work in regardless of the cause of PTSD. Yeah. So I, I think the way to make Ibogaine into a medicine, the way to make psilocybin into a medicine, LSD, it's, it's through accepting the scientific methodological approach as developed by regulatory agencies. And instead of saying, you know, that's oppressive or, Mm -hmm. you know, it it takes around $50 million, I would say. So that's an enormous amount of money. But when you think of all these billionaires, Sacklers. (laughs) Well, we've approached them. That's so good. Did you know that we've been in touch with them? No, but it seems like maybe they need to get behind this. Well, here's it's funny that you mentioned that. So the same person, Thor Halverson, who started the Human Rights Foundation, is Mm -hmm. the one that introduced me to Rebecca Mercer, Elizabeth Koch, and Richard Sackler. So what we propose to Sackler, there's all sorts of things about uh, toxic uh, donors. Uh, but it seems like from an ethical point of view that if the Sacklers were to, you know, they were the owners of Purdue Pharma and OxyContin and all, that if they were to support fund, funding 
research into the treatment of opiate addiction, that that would be completely appropriate. And so mm-hmm. that's what we were asking them for. They had us talk with the uh, Purdue Pharma Office of um, Social Responsibility, Corporate Responsibility, which was a newly formed <laughs> office. <laughs> and what was really disappointing to me was that in the end, they decided not to fund I began research. And then a few months after that, they came out with a statement that they had patented a new approach to treating addiction, which was a new maintenance drug, mm. that they had made some kind of combinations. And so they, they were, in a way, proposing they would make money off of weeding people off of opiates and, and get you on these drugs that you need to take, like methadone, on a daily basis for months or years or decades at a time. So I say the Sacklers had an opportunity to directly remedy some of the problems that they helped cause and chose not to. So we need $50 million. We need to clear some studies <laughs> and then yeah. we can change. We can I think so. solve the opioid epidemic. Yeah. Although I would say that what we really need is just this two and a half million. So what, the first thing we need to do is, can we do the safety study that would be presented to the FDA and would satisfy them that we could go the rest of the way? Let's do it. Thanks for listening to my chat with Rick Doblin. I think it's incredible that he's put his back into this research for so many decades, knowing that he was essentially trying to push a massive boulder up a hill, and that we're finally seeing the light of day of all of this work reaching more people. To learn more about psychedelics and MDMA therapy, head to maps.org. Now, over to GP for today's AMA. What is something that people usually forget about or don't take into consideration enough when creating their own business? I'm on the track and feeling the fear of self-doubt, asks Alex. Wow. Well, Alex, first of all, bravo, because you're embarking on something incredibly brave. And I wish that there was an easier solution that I could give you. But you're really going to be the only one as an entrepreneur to assuage your self-doubt. And that's really part of the entrepreneurial process, you know, to weather the ups and downs, but really you're always going to have to come back to the place of believing in yourself more than anybody else. And that's not always easy to do. Believe me, you're going to really have to be the person to shore yourself up. And I think that means that you're going to have to get really intimate with what's going on in your mind, body, and heart, and take time every day to really check in with yourself. Because I think that when you're in your body and you're present, it's easier to feel what's real and might be an issue for you to tackle or what might be fear and those negative voices coming in. It's really important to be able to separate those two things, but good luck. Thank you, GP. If you have your own question you want GP to answer, drop us a line at Goop on Instagram or Facebook. That's it for today's episode. If you have a chance, please rate and review. Hit subscribe to keep up with new episodes and pass it along to a friend. Thanks again for joining. I hope you'll come back next week for more. And in the meantime, you can check out goop.com slash the podcast.